So as those who are up, grab a seat. I don't want to take a moment to say it is a privilege this morning to um, welcome as a very special guest, and yet it feels strange to think of that in terms of guests because it was many years ago, the year I will not identify, by which I had moved back here after a short time of living abroad, and this was home, and I'd been living in India for a bit, and I moved back here and become a part of this church. And around that same time, a couple moved back from living in Thailand among the poor, and they moved back to this area and were part of this church, and we both ended up on staff, on the pastoral team together. We were ordained together. Don't know if there's ended up with a picture of that or not, but uh, yeah, it is there. There it is. Look at that, John. Wow. Good looking, man. Yeah. Really good looking group. You're like, I'm not sure which is which. That's okay. <laughs> the point is that um, it was a privilege then, and then it's a privilege that in 1991, um, John Elmer and his wife Gwen uh, took and went back to their home, but I'll let him share more about that in Syracuse, New York, with the team that came from the West Side Vineyard joining them. and. That church has grown uh, to be a multi-site church that is serving much of central New York. And John has continued to serve the Vineyard Movement in all sorts of roles and just now joining the national team. Uh, and I could say much, much more, but what I want to do is invite you to welcome back John Elmer. <laughs> Well, it is great to be back. This is literally the first time I've been back at church. at the, And I always call you guys the Santa Monica Vineyard because that's how I came in. But the West L.A. Vineyard, it is um, a real privilege to be here. It's, it, it's kind of interesting how I ended up here. So my wife and I, um, we uh, moved out here to get trained to, for missions. And we went to the U.S. Center for World Missions, and, which is up, was up in Pasadena, and uh, when we got here, we didn't know any church. We asked around there, like, hey, is there a good church around? Some people point us to a church. And uh, I started going there. Now, to understand this, the church was kind of a, a wealthy church. I didn't know it when I first went, when I went to it, but it was, it was wealthy. And it was a good church. A guy preached well. And, and at that time, I was in the stage of my life where I was at, at war with materialism. So... I lost the war, by the way. Materialism won. Um, but I, 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 we, we didn't own a car. We, I had two pairs of army fatigue pants and two T-shirts. And long hair, Fu Manchu. And, you know, a lot of people have mistake me for a homeless person a lot of times. And I, um, I went to this church, and, you know, we liked it. And we kind of stayed around. And I introduced myself to the pastor and let him know, uh, hey, if you ever need somebody to do a small group, I would love to, get, you know, do that stuff and teach, and I'm going to be a missionary. And he said, okay. And it um, wasn't causing any problem, just going to church and back. And, and about six months there, he comes up to me. He said, at their services, we need to talk. So, oh, and I'm, I'm like all excited. I think he's going to ask me to do a small group. He's going to invite me to do something. This is going to be great. And, and so he pulls me over the kind of the corner, and he says, uh, you don't fit here. You should go somewhere else. And flicks his hand like, like I was like a, a bug on his face, like, go somewhere else. And I said, what? Excuse me? I, I mean, I, I thought he was joking. I was just like confused. He says, you, you don't fit here. You should go somewhere else. And I was stunned. It was like I was punched in the gut. And I just, well, uh, uh, where should I go? Like, I didn't know. I knew in the area. I didn't know anything. And I just got kicked out of a church. And, I, you know, well, where should I go? He says, you should go to the vineyard. They'll take anybody. <laughs> so because your bar was so low that even I could react to it, that's how I ended up in the vineyard. And it was great, man. It was because of that. Uh, I, I was so uh, needy of, of healing and training and encouragement and a community of faith. And uh, my life was transformed here. I actually got baptized here when I was part of this church, ordained. Um, it was a great experience on staff for three and a half years with Brad as well. So 
Thank you for all this church has meant. You know, Keith and Greg and Russ. I, I've seen a couple of you that are still around from, from my day, so um, it's good to be here. You know, Brad asked me to talk about how to hear from God today. And we all want that, right? Like, like life is confusing. Life is, is hard. Life, life demands a lot. And we, we need, a lot of times we need comfort. We need insight. We, we need a voice that is wiser than us, that, that loves us more than we know, to, to, to speak into what's going on. We want somebody greater than ourselves to help us make the steps we need to do. You know, when I was in junior high, my parents, uh, grade school and junior high, they went through a separation and a divorce, and it was messy, and, and um, I had this coach, his name was Mr. Masser, and he, I looked up to him, man, he was incredible, and I just remember, and he gave me a ride home from practice, and just, you know, he was a hard, he was like, if, he was like the old school hard-nosed coach. But one day as he's dropping me off, he just looked at me and said, it's going to be all right. You'll be okay. That was it. And then, you know, no more emotions ever again. But that was powerful for me. And there's so many places in our lives where we need to hear from someone bigger, smarter, more experienced than us. We need to hear from God. And so my first point is this. God wants to speak to people. He loves humanity. He's like, honestly, head over heels in love with you. He created you in his image, and he loves you and all the potential he sees in you. And when we really love someone... We want to communicate with them, right? I mean, maybe some of you might be dating right now or remember when you were dating, you first got married. And you just always wanted to talk. My, my wife, Gwen, uh, we, we, when we started dating, we were in New York City, and it was, you know, we would go after work, she'd come and uh, volunteer at my community center, and we'd be there, and afterwards we'd go, and we'd have a, walk over to this little restaurant, we'd have a long, like, three-hour dinner, it was just a hole in the wall, we'd get a little corner booth, and we would talk, 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 and, and we'd, I'd, I'd bring her home, and I would walk home from her place, which was 20 minutes at most, and as soon as I got home, see, it was before cell phones, I couldn't do it when I was walking. There was a day before cell phones. Does anybody remember that at all? Yeah, there's a few of us. And, and I got home, and the first thing I would do, we'd get to the phone and, you know, dial her number and say, how are you doing? Oh, it was a great walk. Thanks for asking. You know, we just wanted to talk because we loved each other. And Jesus wants to talk to us. Love wants to communicate. And you know what? God has a history of it, especially to nobodies. Because we think, oh, you know, uh, Jesus is so big and so powerful. He's got the whole world, and that's a big deal. And it is. But he really wants to talk to each one of us. I mean, the Bible, the story of God's engagement with humanity is full. There's, there's this guy named Abram, just a, an average Joe. There's Samuel, this young kid. There's, there's Amos, an old farmer. There's Mary, an unmarried teen girl. There's Joseph, a, a, a kind of cranked up, a, 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 um, upset carpenter. There's, there's Paul, this violent, self-righteous leader. There's, there's the church in, in, in Antioch. There's all kinds of stories. You just read it, and it's God seeking to talk to us. You know, the Bible lets us know that he, he wants to communicate to us. Let me just read a couple of places. It says this. Surely the sovereign Lord, the all-powerful, mighty God, surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan 
to his servants. Now, if you've connected with Jesus, if you have a personal relation, how that matches up is, is you're saying, I will follow you. I'm, I'm submitting to you. I'm your servant. Use me any way you want. And he wants to communicate. He reveal his plan, what's, what's coming up, what's going on to each of us. You know, um, the psalmist writes this. He says, hear Hear me, my people. This is God speaking through the psalmist. Hear me, my people. See, they had relationship, and he, he, he wants to communicate. He said, look, I'm communicating. Listen up. You know, hello, McFly, listen. Hear me, my people, and I will warn you, if you'd only listen to me. He wants to talk to us. And a lot of times, we ain't listening. We're so busy with this and that. We listen to a podcast or music or, you know, running over the last conversation we had in our head. Running from this to that. You know, crushing candy just in case too much of it falls, right? We just keep our mind busy and we don't listen. Listen to what Jesus said. Um, this is at their... He has his last meal with some of his best friends. And he knows that he's about to get arrested, beaten, whipped, go through a sham of a trial, and be brutally murdered. He knows it's coming. So he's talking about some of the most important things at that moment. And he says, I have so much more to say to you. More than you can bear right now. Like, I can't overwhelm you. But when the spirit of truth comes, that's the Holy Spirit. And you get the Holy Spirit when you connect with Jesus. That's one of the things. He gives us his spirit as a, as a, as a deposit, as a guarantee, as a, a tattoo on his soul. And that's how connected we are. But the spirit of truth comes he will guide you into all truth. He will speak to you and lead you and direct you, just like Mr. Masser did for me that day, getting out of the car. He'll not speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears, and he'll tell you what is yet to come. He wants to communicate to us, to us personally. And he does it all kinds of ways. He, he can do it in dreams when our defenses are down. I'm, I'm not saying every, every dream you had, you know, you're standing in front, you know, naked in front of your third grade class or something. You may just have too much pizza that night, okay? But he does use dreams and can as our defenses are down. There's at times that he speaks and it's a nudge, a sense. That yeah, you, you know in your knower that, that this, this thought didn't come from you, but came somewhere else. An impression. A picture. Now, sometimes he may speak and it feels like a, a very clear voice. Or, you know, rarely, but sometimes he, he may even speak audibly. There's, there's, sometimes it's scriptures that he gives us. He highlights a, a particular sentence in his book. That gives us direction. You know, when I was, um, Gwen and I were just feeling called to, to plant a church. We went through that process to hear from the Lord. We really felt like we heard. But then the question came, where are we going to plant? I mean, we, we, we were here. We owned a house in Inglewood. Uh, one thought was just, just start a church there in Inglewood. One thought was move back to New York City. We loved it there. We fell in love. We had a bunch of friends there. We could go there. We, we thought of, of Pittsburgh. I had some friends there. We thought of Syracuse. And we were really wrestling. Keith, I'm sure you remember this. Like, we prayed, and we prayed hard, and we had friends praying for us. And it was a couple months between we were sure he told us a call to, to plant and, and where. 
And I remember one day I was, I was in this, we had this little small backyard in our place in Inglewood, and I'm sitting on a love seat. It's a beautiful sunny day, and I'm just sitting here rocking. I got my Bible next to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to talk. I'm like, Jesus, like, where do you want me to go? I will take my family anywhere. Will you just please tell me? Like, this is frustrating. This, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to go anything, but I need to know it's you. I need to be able to hang it on. And then this, this almost shouting out in frustration of God, like, speak to me, please. This is clear as a bell. This, this biblical address comes to me. Genesis 31.3. And I'll give you $20. Everybody can quote that right now. Like, where is that? Like, what, what is that, you know? And I, I grab my Bible, and I'm, I'm flipping through, and my mind's running like, like what is this? Could it, could it be like, is he, is he sending us, you know, to 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 Egypt was this when when Joe's in Egypt? Is he is he maybe sent us to to Jerusalem? Is is it is it some like you know you know little tiny place that's mentioned like Goshen? I'll end up in Goshen, Indiana. Like like I'm freaking out, I'm flipping through the book, right? And I get to it, and it says, "And the Lord said to Jacob, I am sending you to the land of your fathers." And I will bless you. And it was like, boom. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, the land of my fathers was Syracuse. Born and raised. You know, my dad lived on the north side. My, my mom lived in the western suburbs. My, my brother lived in Fairmount, this other sister. My sister lived in, in Liverpool. I mean, we, we were all there. That, I, you know, the, I, I, that's my home. That's what I love. I, I cherry for the, you know, Syracuse orange. When you cut me, I bleed orange. Let's go orange. Let's go orange. How did Syracuse, New York, in the tundra, get the orange? We have a little, a, literally an orange as our mascot. Uh, an orange hasn't grown in Syracuse ever, right? You know, but I don't know how it happened, but it is. But the Lord called me. And that word is, is, has been out for 31 years when the proverbial crap hit the fan. And I wanted to quit and I wanted to move back. And I, I would, I would, maybe should I call back Brad and back, beg for a job? I don't know if you would have given it to me or not. <laughs> I had that word from the Lord. And it allowed me the press I had. God wants to speak. Sometimes it's through scripture. Sometimes it's, it's through circumstances. Sometimes this is really important. He speaks through community. You see, I think sometimes we're scared about hearing the voice of God. But it's because we've seen too many people in their isolation, get weird about it, right? Yeah, God called me to have, uh, you know, a latte today. And like, it's like, like, like everything, or God called me to, you know, do something weird. And it's oftentimes people miss because they're not in community and they're not embracing God's word, which is the Bible. And so things could get weird. So it's really important. Community, God uses community so often to speak and direct us. The church in Antioch, God spoke to them and sent Paul off and Barnabas on missionary journeys. There's time and time again where we see the community of faith. So be in a community, be in a small group, be, have friends that, that, that keep us balanced, help us to hear more. Get godly people you trust. You know, sometimes he talks, you're doing God in film. Sometimes he talks through movies. I love going to movies. And, I, and there's been a, a number of times where I've sat in movies and God's interrupted it and spoke to me. Do you remember that movie? This was years ago, uh, Sully, about the guy who uh, landed the plane in the Hudson River. And in that movie, I'm watching, you know, ah, eating my popcorn, just, you know, not in the zone, not thinking about anything except for, man, that would have been cool to be on that plane. And, and, and suddenly he's in, he's, in a, he's in a court thing. And in the middle of it, he says this. He says, my job is to save lives. And suddenly 
Like alarm bells went off. The Spirit of God just kind of shook me and said, that's me talking to you. Your job as this leader of this, this vineyard church in Syracuse is to serve the community and help the community connect with Jesus so that they could have eternal life. He spoke clearly, and that refocused us and kept us on track. You know, it's just listening. You know, um, and sometimes, so he wants to talk to you as an individual. Sometimes, he wants to talk to you for someone else to help. This is part of that being part of a community. You know, my second point is this. We are invited to move in the prophetic. Uh, you and me. Now, uh, as soon as I say that my word, sometimes, you know, people's minds go off in all kind of directions, right? It's kind of a, a, an odd word that represents all kinds of people. I mean, maybe you think of like Moses that goes off on the mountain and comes down with stone tablets. Maybe it's a psychic late at night on TV, and if, you know, 900-372, you, you're going to get, you know, call this number, and you're going you're to get a word. You know, maybe it's a crazy guy screaming in the corner when we think that. You know, on the street corner, there's, there's this guy, when I lived in New York, he was always on this one corner in Times Square area, and he's always screaming, you know, the world's going to end, the world's going to end. I don't know if he's still there, but the world didn't end. But you don't have to be crazy. I think when God thinks about this word of prophetic, of talking to you in a way that you can communicate to others, that's love, that's engagement, that's, that's helping people who have been closed off or can't hear. It looks a lot different than maybe what we think about. It's like the mom who comforts her child with just the right words from the Holy Spirit. Or it's a guy at work talking around the break area, giving supernatural insights by the Holy Spirit to that person right before they go back online. Or it's a teen in study hall talking him back, encouraging a friend from God's heart. Friends bumping into each other at, you know, at a grocery store. And one, listening to the Spirit and giving a, a word of knowledge. The, pro, the prophetic is, is an everybody thing in our normal lives. Like one of the vineyard sayings is naturally supernatural. That supernatural, sometimes we always think, well, you got to go to a church building and, and that's this, you'll, you'll, then the supernatural can happen. But it's supposed to naturally happen in our everyday life. No hype, no nothing. Here's a definition by a guy named Wayne Grudem for the prophetic. He says, it's speaking merely human words to report something God brings to mind. You know, it could be a nudge, a whisper, uh, and we communicate it. You know, and when we do it naturally, it's not really that weird. It can be really powerful. You know, and it's important to Jesus. Check this out. In the letter that Paul wrote to this church in Corinth, at one point he starts talking about spiritual gifts. He's these kind of supersizing anointments uh, uh, that drop gracelets that, 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 that enlarge our ability, that beyond our own ability. And you know, spiritual gifts. And he talks about them, but then he says, he stops, and he says, man, but you know the most important thing? is love. Like we're doing it out of love because we care for people. Because that's why God communicates. That's what Jesus communicates because he loves us. He does this whole beautiful thing. If you've ever been to a wedding, you've probably heard the whole scripture from him. And then, and then he, he finishes his talk about love. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. These, these supersizing touches from God that, that, that happen in teaching. It can happen in, in miraculous or, or healing prayer. But, but he says this, eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. 
He's saying like there's something especially important about hearing from the Lord for ourselves and for others. And then, and then we see in the, in the book of Acts, Jesus just ascended to heaven. He says, hey, wait here and the Holy Spirit's going to come. And, you know, in the second chapter of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit is, is dropped on the people of God. It's incredible. It's, it's, they're shaking. There's, there's, there's these, you know, tongues of fire and, and, and people are gathered. And, and the disciples, they, they begin to preach and they communicate to people with all different languages. And it, it, what actually happens is, is that's the day that the church, in a sense, is born and it's this beautiful mosaic of a church of people from different lands and speaking different languages and different colors and different cultures and, and different economic standings and men and women. It, it's, it's this incredibly diverse group of people that are called together to be the church. The most diverse organization that ever was at that moment was the church. But as, it, as the Spirit's about to fall and is falling, Peter is highlighted by the Holy Spirit of what a prophet had said in the Old Testament. And he preached, he preached that, and he says, in the last days, I want you to understand what the last days are. We're in the last days. The last days started when Jesus ascended into heaven, and the last days end when Jesus returns. So there have been about 2,000 years of last days. It could be 2,000 years in one day. It could be 3,000 years or 4,000 years. No one knows. But in the last days, that's the season we're at right now. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit. He's pouring out this abundance. He, he wants us to have the spirit. He wants the spirit to be stirred in us and moving. That, that we're not just, you know, in the natural. We are moving in the supernatural where God does communicate. I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Let me do a quick survey, okay? First time back in 31 years. Let me just get a, a quick feel. If you are or ever have been a son of somebody, raise your hand and keep it up. Just hold it up. Come on. Okay, keep it up. Keep it up for a second. If, if you've ever been or are right now a daughter of someone, raise your hand. Keep your hand. So it should be everybody's hand. If your hand's not up, I'm thinking, hmm, where'd you come from? You know? Okay, you put them down. This is all of us. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women. It's incredible for the gospel. Is, is, is holding women up to its, their rightful spot. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. God wants us all to be listening to hear his word for ourselves and for others. And the awesome thing is God invites all of us into the game to be used in this way. The prophet, here's my last point. The prophetic is given to build people up. It's not a trophy that, okay, you've been so well behaved, I'm gonna give you this thing. It's not a weapon to, to beat people up, like, oh, I wanna get them to do something, so I'm gonna say God said it. It's a tool to help people feel loved and to grow. Let me read you one last thing from from Corinthians, after what I previously read you, Paul writes this. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Prophetic words lift people up. They help people grow. They're full of love and grace. The prophetic is God communicating what he needs, what we need to hear through one of his servants. Tell me, let me tell you a story about when someone spoke God's heart to me. This was um, 
about 12 years ago, you know. So I planted church 31 years ago, and it grew, and, I, and things are going well. And I was given, um, I was asked to take this translocal role uh, of being an area leader, and I, I did that for um, about 15 years. And at one point, they asked me to oversee um, a region, which at that time, the region was about 70 churches. And it was a big deal, and a lot of responsibility. And I was taking over for this person who I, I just thought was one of the greatest leaders, incredible leader, uh, Phil Stroud. He became the national leader for the vineyard. Good friend of mine. I was taking over for him, and let me tell you, it, it felt very intimidating. It's like it was like, oh yeah, okay, Babe Ruth can't play today. We're gonna put you in. You know, it's like holy smokes, like, and I was really intimidated and really nervous, scared. No confidence that I could do this. And the first, one of the first things I did, I, I, I had a host, a, a, a conference, and uh, it was all the different pastors had come in for this. And we did worship. And I, I'm telling you, honestly, I'm, I'm just in there going, bah, 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 what am I going to do? I'm like, you know, they're going to boo me. I'm not Phil. I'm not this. I'm not that. And I was really feeling incredibly insecure. And, and, at the worship, you know, there's like a kind of a ministry time where, where people got to pray for one another and listen. This, this woman come over, I'll never forget, her name was Bonnie. She was a, a pastor in Massachusetts. And she comes over to me. And I'm just standing there. And she comes over and begins praying for me. And it's like New England accent with no R's, you know. Like, and uh, she says, I just feel like the Lord just gave me a picture. He says, it was you, and you were wearing uh, one of those little Burger King crowns, you know, those little crowns I give kids, which was pretty funny because, like, a couple days before, I was out with a bunch of friends, and uh, we went, and we had to stop and get something, and I grabbed one of those crowns, and, like, I'm being like a jerk, you know, like, oh, look at me, I'm the king, you know, I want my burger, and, and, and uh, like, that flashed to me, and she said, but this silly little crown suddenly turned into like this, this gold, regal, beautiful crown. And she said, I believe that the Lord's telling you, even though you think you just deserve a paper crown, I've put you in this spot, and I've anointed you for it. And it just was this, the presence of God filled me, strengthened my soul. Gave me courage to lead. I, I led that region for 11 years. And it's, it's those kinds of words. It was like when Mr. Messier said, it's going to be all right. We need that. The prophetic has great power. Listening and hearing from God for ourselves and for others is really part of what you have been made for and to do. I just want to end with this, this um, kind of way, like, how do we do this? How can you hear the voice of God? And I'll put it a simple way. Stop, drop, and roll. When we were little kids, I don't know why they're always teaching little kids what would happen. What do you do if you catch on fire? I don't know why their big fear was little kids were going to catch on fire, right? I've never met a kid who's been caught on fire. But, but they would teach us in school, stop, drop, and roll. And I thought, that's actually good advice for hearing from the Lord. First thing, stop. Like, we are so busy, we're so preoccupied, we always have to have the TV on, or, you know, some music on, or headphones on, we always got to be on our, our phone in some way, we're, we're, we're always so busy that there's so much clutter that it's hard for anybody to get their voice through to us. And so there's a part of this of stop, of create space of open up your, your ears, your heart, your, your, your spiritual ears. If you want to hear from the Lord, 
The best way, now he's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. And, and, and you could stop, drop, and roll until the cows come home, and it may not change anything, right? But these things help create space for it to happen. First thing is stop. Listen in that, in that quietness. Stop. Drop. Drop is the prey. Drop to your knees, right, symbolically. Like, Jesus, I need to hear from you. I want to hear from you. Jesus, I, I, I'm, I'm walking through the grocery store. Is there anybody here? That, is there anything you want to say to anybody that I'm going to bump into that I know? You know, drop, pray. Can just invite Jesus to speak to you. Invite Jesus to shape you. and Invite Jesus to use you in the prophetic, to, to, to lead you. Stop, drop, and then roll. Okay, this is a little stretch, but roll with it. You got to do it, man. <laughs> Have you ever been in a relationship where somebody keeps telling you something? You like to refer to it as nagging, right? And my wife and I were going, you know, well, we used to have this thing with, like, you know, hey, you're nagging me. And finally, I came up with this thing. I said, it's not nagging if you never listen to me. <laughs> she would say the same thing back to me, and that was our little, like, shut up, you are nagging, kind of hint to each other. But it gets frustrating, doesn't it? And so I think my experience has been the more we stop, create space, the more we ask Jesus to speak, the more often we let what he says to us actually affect what we do, that we roll with what he said, the more often he's going to keep communicating. Stop, drop, and roll. You know, I think you'd be really surprised how often God wants to speak to you in your everyday life. Now, here's what I want to do to end. It's called a public service. Y'all got busy days, right? Even today might be your day off, and you probably got 17 things to do. And you're going to start work on Monday, and you're going to be running. And, and all that I just said is going to kind of get lost. So what I want to do is give you a moment now to stop, drop, and roll. I'm going to create space for you to listen. So here's what I just asked you to do, just for a moment. Would everybody close your eyes? I'm not going to take your purse or your wallet or anything, Okay. Does anybody have an iPhone 13, though? Let me just go over here. <laughs> just close your eyes for a moment, okay? And that's just to kind of close out distractions. I want you to understand, that as you, with your eyes closed here, that we're in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says in the praises, he dwells in the praises of his people. We worshiped him. He leans into this place. Jesus said we're, we're two or more gathered, that he's there in a special way. So he, you, you may be here and not even have a relationship with Jesus. I want to tell you, he's leaned in to you right now. Like just take a moment to just take a long, deep breath in of the, the peace of God. Hold it for a moment and then slowly let out all the kind of anxiety that's in there. And now you're in the presence of the Lord. I want you in the quietness of your heart to just say, Jesus, if I want to hear from you. Speak to me. Just invite him to communicate. And just be sensitive to any senses or words or pictures or nudge you might feel.
just in the quietness of your heart, if you got any kind of sense, and a random thought popped in, I just want you to ask, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Ask, is this for me? Or is it for somebody else? And who might that be if it is? Jesus, I pray that you would help each one of us this week to stop, drop, and roll. I pray you give each each individual in this room space to hear your voice, sensitivity to how you're seeking to communicate, and I pray you give them the, the courage to roll with what you say. Amen. Now, before I close in prayer, I think that's what I'm supposed to do, but I, I have, I had two senses that I think was for somebody here. One was, I thought, I think that the Lord was saying for somebody, you know, you're, I'm not done with you. I have way more for you yet. And the other thing I felt was for, for maybe a couple people here, I felt like the Lord was saying, you're forgiven. There's something you did. There's some way you, you messed up and you have not been able to forgive yourself. And I believe that Jesus is saying very clearly to you, if, if something just jumped in your heart when I'm saying this, this is you, and I want you to hear that, Jesus says, you're forgiven. So, do we do a worship song now? Have at it, I'm done. Let's just stand together if you're able. Stay in this attitude of prayer, allowing the Lord to speak. Spirit, we're asking you, send living waters to fall on this weary land again. Just your gifts we want. Please come and visit as the rain. Come and visit as the rain.